to History Obscura, the place where dark and sometimes dirty secrets are dug up from our near and distant past and presented purely for your amusement. I am your host, Mandy Gardner. I'd like to begin today's episode with an excerpt from the 1697 story, Bluebeard, written by Charles Perrault. The story features a man called Bluebeard, a gruesome character who, just like the man in our main story today, marries a succession of women who are never seen again. Once upon a time, there was a lady who was very unsure about her new husband's orders not to look behind a certain door. She considered what unhappiness might attend her if she was disobedient, but the temptation was strong and she could not overcome it. So she took the little key she'd found and opened the forbidden door, trembling. At first, she could not see anything plainly because the windows were shut from the sun. After some moments, she began to perceive that the floor was all covered with clotted blood, on which lay the bodies of all Bluebeard's previous wives. She thought she should have died for fear, and the key, which she pulled out of the lock, fell out of her hand into the bloody mess below. Now for the second Once Upon a Time. In the year 1890, John Schmidt was finished with Europe, finished with his family, and excited to land on the eastern shore of America alongside millions of other hopeful immigrants. It was a busy year for Americans. The first female White House staffer, Alice Sanger, took her place in a male-dominated office. President Woodrow Wilson officially advised the Mormon Church to discontinue the practice of bigamy. The nation's big cities boomed with industry, and people poured in looking for salaried work in the factories. As for Schmidt, he set up house in New York City, apparently looking to start fresh with his new wife, Annie. He had left behind him in Germany his legal wife, Christine, and at least three children. And, as we learned later, probably a few dead bodies. John Schmidt, who came to be called the Bluebeard Killer because of his similarity to that 1697 story, was apparently using the alias Jacob Hoff as soon as he hit the New World. It was a habit he would keep up through the following decades of his life, always cleaning the slate by taking up a new name and moving to a new city once his behavior started to rattle a few cages. And when he felt the need to start his twisted, murderous cycle all over again, Jacob Schmidt, and the myriad names used by this dark character from the infrequently seen underbelly of American early history, were all just labels affixed to a man who compulsively married lonely, vulnerable women and then killed or abandoned them and stole their life savings. Let's refer to him as Schmidt today, just so we can stay on the same page. It's possible that when Schmidt first moved to the United States, he'd actually hoped to reinvent himself. His alias does suggest he had a less than clean past, and he wanted to get away from that. Many sources confirm that Schmidt moved overseas with an Austrian woman, Annie, which also suggests intent to make a fresh start. After all, if he wanted to do away with Annie, it would have been much simpler to do so before setting foot on a boat for seven days and setting up a new home in a foreign land. There is another potential explanation for the long commitment, however, and it is much darker and more sinister. Schmidt 
never bothered to divorce his first wife, so although he participated in as many as 50 marriage ceremonies during his life, none were actually legal except Christine Ram. She died around the year 1890. The two had married when Schmidt was in his mid-twenties. But once he left Germany, he made no attempts to contact Christine or their children, nor to make amends in any way. It isn't clear whether his new wife, Annie, knew about the family. Whatever she knew, or thought she knew, about the man she'd married, there's no sign that Annie had any suspicions about wrongdoing. She brought no family members with her and trusted herself entirely in the hands of this man she knew as Jacob Hoff. So, what do we know about Annie Schmidt? We know that she was chronically ill, reportedly an invalid before moving to the United States. We do not know whether she was ill upon meeting John Schmidt or became so afterwards but she was almost certainly bedridden for as many as two or three years while living in New York City. During this time, she must have relied on her husband to provide her with basic care like meals and medicine, particularly since she had no family or friends around to help. Her sickness progressed very slowly, torturing her over long months and eventually years as she remained in the care of her husband and his administrations. Unfortunately, the cause of Annie's illness and its particular symptoms are lost to history, but we have our suspicions. Was Annie's sickness an early attempt by Schmidt to kill his wife with arsenic? the poison that he would later use on as many as 15 American women in the late 1880s, 1890s, and early 1900s? Arsenic was available from the pharmacy to treat conditions like psoriasis or syphilis. It was also prolific in many other industries, used in green pigments for dyeing fabric and wallpaper, or to create long-burning candles. Though many people, including doctors, toxicologists, and forensic researchers, knew the substance was extremely dangerous, it was not officially recognized as so much as an unhealthy ingredient until 1880. Even then, its use persisted and people like John Schmidt could buy it with little trouble. Arsenic poisonings were incredibly frequent during the Victorian era, both in the United States and in Great Britain. Usually used on annoying family members, murderers knew that a little arsenic in a victim's food every day would make them slowly sicker and sicker, as though afflicted with a common gastrointestinal disease, such as cholera. Small doses cause sleepiness, headaches, and confusion while large doses or prolonged poisoning caused blood in the urine, problems swallowing, a metallic taste in the mouth, stomach cramps, vomiting, and diarrhea. Most symptoms match those of normal food poisoning and were not particularly alarming. Even when death occurred, it was a primitive time for medical diagnosis and unsanitary food was also quite common. The trickiest part of using arsenic on your loved ones was how much was the right amount, and how long should one keep lacing their victim's food before the poor man, woman, or child succumbed and died? These were not questions Schmidt could ask the pharmacist. And so, perhaps, he used Annie as a guinea pig playing with the amount of arsenic for months and taking note of the degree of its effects on her. If she were indeed his test subject for later murders, the woman must have suffered immensely with no idea as to the cause. Post-mortem testing was still generally clumsy at the end of the 19th century, meaning that only a professional autopsy might reveal any wrongdoing missed by an attending physician. And in the case of arsenic and other poisons, 
Only coroners using the most forward-thinking methods would find it. There was one more reason why arsenic was Schmidt's and many other Victorian murderers' weapon of choice. It was impossible to confirm arsenic poisoning on an exhumed, embalmed body. Even if the victim had received an immense dose prior to death, there was no way for a physician to know this once the body had been embalmed. Though many recipes existed for embalming fluid at the time, the ones that actually worked all contained arsenic. Therefore, every embalmed body would test positive for the poison. Once the funeral was paid for, murderers had virtually nothing to worry about. Even if literally every person around them believed the victim had been poisoned. When John's long-suffering wife finally died a few years after they'd arrived in New York City, he once more scrapped his identity and moved on to a fresh location. Schmidt's second stop was Chicago, as far as one detective, George Marion Shippey, could piece together from dozens of testimonies. At the end of the 19th century, Chicago proved exactly the sort of bustling community a man like John Schmidt was looking for. It was crowded, full of political schemes, crime, and populated with hopeful and desperate people. The local government was busy prepping for the next year's massive World's Columbian Exposition. George Shippey, the man who would eventually track and arrest Schmidt, had just been promoted to captain of police that first year. However, the bigamy and nefarious practices of Schmidt's multiple identities had not yet been on Shippey's radar. Once in the booming industrial city in 1892, Schmidt worked quickly, renting apartments, meeting lonely women, and proposing marriage at phenomenal speed. He married as many as three women that same year, all of whom were dead within weeks of their weddings. It was here where Schmidt really started to spread his wings, so to speak. Perfecting his con as an apparently wealthy bachelor in the freedom of a busy city, he centered himself on a largely German part of the city where he could connect with others who shared his culture and language. Then, he preyed upon women whose names he found in the pages of the newspaper classifieds. The so-called Lonely Hearts pages had been published since the 1860s, giving hope to all kinds of people wanting to meet other people. For most publishing a personal advertisement, it was a genuine attempt to make a romantic connection. However, for Schmidt, the ads were just providing an easy list of potential victims. Schmidt didn't just read through the ads of Chicago's papers either. He actually posted a few himself. This is one such example from Schmidt himself. Matrimonial German Own home Wishes acquaintance of widow without children. Object, matrimony. Later on, John became Jacob Schmidt when he moved to the Windy City. He wooed and married a woman identified there as Mrs. Hoyle. She is the only wife in a quick succession of three whose name was even partially recalled by the couple's neighbors. And she, too, died soon after joining her assets with the man she knew as Jacob. At this point, it's clear that Schmidt knew how to get quick results with his supply of arsenic. There were no long months and years of agony, no long-term caretaking or experimentation, just a swiftly onset illness, followed two weeks later by death. Aside from simply absconding with the small amounts of cash or valuables his wife possessed, 
There was a new and tempting reason for Schmidt to do away with the women who wanted to spend their lives with him. Life insurance. The industry had begun in England more than a century earlier. But in the industrial age, the idea of protecting one's family after the loss of a wage earner really started to catch on. Life insurance was the new trend, and funnily enough, it caught on right alongside the secret use of arsenic. Schmidt undoubtedly saw how the two products could be used together to provide him with much larger payloads. He was sure to complete all the necessary paperwork to make himself the sole beneficiary if one of his dear wives should pass away. With insurance being a fairly new business, people like Schmidt had no trouble arranging such legal contracts despite the fact that the recipient was ill and dying, or had never earned money, or in fact wasn't even present to sign the documents. It is entirely possible that ladies like the deceased Mrs. Hoyle Schmidt and her successors had no idea life insurance policies had even been taken out for them. Then, as now, but with far fewer complications, it was completely possible to take multiple life insurance policies on the same person. If Schmidt was well prepared, he could have put together several insurance claims on the same spouse and made off with quite a bit of money. This may have proven frustratingly difficult for him, however, since he was not likely to hold valid personal identification. It's most probable, therefore, that the bevy of identities used by Schmidt to avoid persecution actually limited his ability to cash out on the women he poisoned though at least one insurance company would have accepted his case, most probably required more documentation than he could provide. So, to keep things simple, Mitt continued to do the simple cash grab from his deceased wives. As the personal ad posted by Schmidt shows, he did attempt to align himself with widows who had probably already inherited money from their deceased husbands or had recently collected life insurance themselves. It was doubly clever of him, since not only could he access the money for himself if he married any such widows, but it helped him overcome the losses suffered by his inability to file endless life insurance policies. Widowhood also suggested that there were fewer family members to meddle in the affairs of the women in question, since she would not be particularly young and would not likely be in the home of her parents. The swiftness and deafness with which John Schmidt procured, presumably murdered and robbed his first three Chicago wives gives credence to a theory posited later by Detective Shippey that Schmidt was already a skilled con artist and killer when he arrived in the United States. The only piece of the puzzle that didn't quite fit was Annie, the wife he brought with him from Austria. If Schmidt already knew what he was doing when he emigrated, then why did he make her suffer for so long? There are three reasons Schmidt's first wife in America probably took so long to succumb to her illness. First, Schmidt may have needed her to directly access money, possibly from her family back in Europe. Second, she may have been his first arsenic victim, and he was indeed learning how to use the poison. The last potential reason is perhaps the most outlandish. Could it be that Annie was genuinely ill and that Schmidt actually loved her? If we do assume that arsenic was the cause of Annie Schmidt's death, then her killer used it much more effectively the next time. And after at least three weddings, poisonings, and new names. Eventually, John Otto Schmidt left Chicago in search of fresh victims. This time to Milwaukee. The supposed bachelor, once established there, 
decided to give himself a professional upgrade as well as a new name, presenting himself to society as Dr. James. The confident Dr. James went on the hunt, placing himself in a comfortable part of the city where he could converse with people from Germany and other parts of Europe. It was the same way he'd made contacts in Chicago, and this time the target presented itself in the form of Lena Schmitz. Not much is known about Lena, except that she had a sister named Clara. The ladies were from a German family and probably first-generation immigrants themselves, looking for someone they trusted to start a family with. That person, for Lena, came in the form of an older gentleman who was a German doctor, already seemingly quite established with a good amount of money and what was apparently his own home. Schmidt must have seemed like the ideal husband to any number of German girls at the turn of the century, particularly vulnerable widows with little English and poor grasp of American culture. Schmidt and Lena were married quickly, as was the groom's habit, though it was a different era and marriages were conducted rather more quickly then than they are now, I suppose. Their wedding itself was unlikely much more than a short meeting with a priest in front of two witnesses, one of whom was probably the bride's sister Clara, before the newlyweds moved into the house Schmidt pretended was his own. Schmidt would tell a jury several years later that he genuinely wanted to be married and that he wanted to find the perfect wife. He apparently did put some real thought behind his marriage proposals and even broke off engagements with some women who proved too feisty and strong-willed for him. Lena, it's possible, was a woman whom Schmidt felt could truly provide him with some emotional support and creature comforts. Probably that's what the late Mrs. Dr. James had in mind as well though her attempts to create a warm and loving marital home were unsuccessful. Lena's life lasted no longer than two months after she married the fake doctor. Schmidt's decision to end Lena's life was probably nothing more than a discomfort with the regular concerns of marital life itself. Or perhaps he was just too excited to use his new identity as a medical professional to administer new medicines and tonics to his wife. After all, what good is the title of doctor if you can't administer to the health of your own spouse? Clara, for her part, seemed not to have thought anything untoward had occurred between her sister and Dr. James, because the same year that her sister died, she married the grieving widower herself. One has to wonder whether poor Clara realized what was happening all too late, when her own stomach and bowels began to torture her the same way Lena's must have. Months earlier, did she question the so-called medicines given to her by her loving husband? Did she wonder why her meals tasted of bitter almonds? If she did have a moment of clarity, it was too late by that time to do anything about it. She'd lost her most precious confidant and friend in her sister, and had given everything she had left into the hands of the good doctor. Once both the Schmidt sisters were dead, John calmly collected their worldly possessions, money, and life insurance payouts, and went back to Chicago. Milwaukee had done well for him, and he wouldn't forget it. But a year had passed since Schmidt had left his favorite city, and it was probably with a very eager spring in his step that he headed back south to get reacquainted. Over the next 12 years, Schmidt married as many as 50 women, killing some and merely deserting others in a multitude of cities around the United States. It wasn't until 1905 that Schmidt was finally arrested and brought into court, thanks to the tireless efforts of Detective George Marion Shippey. There, he was tried for the murder of Mary Walker, 
a woman Schmidt had married in Chicago the previous year. Walker allegedly gave Schmidt her life savings of $350, as well as the proceeds from the sale of her candy store, which amounted to $75. After Marie Walker's death, Schmidt married her sister. Upon being deserted and robbed by her new husband, Marie's unnamed sister took the case to the police, and Schmidt was finally put behind bars. While in prison, he received many interviews and he seemed to enjoy his bit of attention and fame. He even shared his top tips for seducing women with the Chicago Sun. To quote, Nine out of every ten women can be won by flattery. Never let a woman know her own shortcomings. Always appear to a woman to be the anxious one. Women like to be told pleasant things about themselves. When you make love, be ardent and earnest. The average man can fool the average woman if he will only let her have her own way at the start. John Schmidt was found guilty of murdering Marie Walker with arsenic, and the jury recommended he be given the death penalty. When the verdict was given, the defendant finally registered some emotion, seeming at last to understand that not only could he be punished, but that he could actually die. Once more, he insisted he had not murdered his wife with arsenic, which, of course, the press went crazy over. Did he murder her some other way? Or did he mean she wasn't his wife? According to the newspapers, women watched the trial anxiously, full-on fainting after hearing the sentence. John did the same back in his prison cell. The following is a newspaper clipping from May 20th, 1905. John Schmidt has collapsed. The convicted wife poisoner, who all through his trial seemed to regard the charge against him as a joke, seemed today to realize for the first time the situation in which he was placed. He spent the greater part of his day in his cell weeping, and at times his sobs were audible throughout the greater part of the prison. His lamentations brought scanty sympathy from his fellow prisoners who jeered at him and constantly urged him to brace up and die like a man. He maintains that he was not properly convicted because three murderers before him were found guilty in 45 minutes and he was convicted in less than 30 minutes. At 2 p.m. on February 23, 1906, John Schmidt climbed the steps of the scaffold and took the opportunity to speak for the last time. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I must die an innocent man. Goodbye. The Chicago Police Department managed to find an undertaker to prepare Schmidt's body for the grave, but every local cemetery refused to inter an executed serial killer. Eventually, they found a plot in Potter's Field, a burial place for people without names or families. His body and exact place of burial have been lost to time. Thank you for listening. Remember to subscribe to History Obscura wherever you listen to podcasts. And hit us up with a nice review on Apple Podcasts, if that's what you use. Have an excellent weekend. Don't let your loneliness get you in trouble out there. Good night.